two, one. <coughs> Cough, we're live. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Keep your little ugh in the beginning too that you did there. Okay, yeah, I was. I there was a cough coming, and I thought that would help. You went, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to Empty Space Podcast, episode 95? Is it four? Damn, 93. Son of a bitch. Yep, 94, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna go with that. And uh yeah. we got um the hard times. We got Bill Conway. Conway. Coming on. From the hard times. Ever heard of it? Not a big deal. But before we get into that, Batch got something to say. I got something to say, and then we'll get into the interview. Okay? Hell yeah, man! So we're gonna start off with some some tough news that the boys got today. Um, longtime friend of ours. Um, got some pretty fucked up news this week. Um, he went in to have his appendix taken out and through testing, they found out that he had cancer in his appendix, thought he was out of the woods, all set. Okay. That's gone. We're good. Wrong. Uh, turns out they found that he has colon cancer and needs to get, um, some of it. I, I, he said he was getting his colon removed tomorrow. Mm which this is Thursday the 20th, so Friday the 21st, he is going in for emergency surgery. Um, this is our good friend Eric Johnson. Um, me and Steve both played, I've played hockey with him for, Christ, I don't know, better part of 10 years now, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to give him a shout out on here. Uh, tell him that we're thinking of him. Um, we wish him the best. And we'll be here to help with anything that you might need. Um, there is a GoFundMe that I will be posting onto the Instagram story. If you can, please donate. Um, he's going to be out of work for a while while he fights this battle. So any little thing will help. Um, you know, really good kid. Um it's a shame. Not even 30 years old yet. So um, it's a scary thing, man, to see one of your good friends go through that. So just wanted to give him a little shout out. And hopefully some of our Empty Space fans will help him out because he would help them out for sure. So, yeah, much, much love to you, Eric. Uh, good. Hell yeah, man. Good, good guy. And, uh, don't wish this upon literally anybody. And no. uh, I, I no, cancer is one hell of a thing. And uh, cancer sucks, man. Yeah, I don't have anything, man. I, I love I love you. I hope you get better, dude. I, I genuinely don't mean like I don't have anything. It's just tough to even talk about. But um, yeah, man. Yeah, man. It's, uh, help support. Shit. I'll be giving you my thoughts, my prayers. I'll, I'll be donating. And if, if, if everyone could just. Do do anything that would be super helpful, and you know, uh, like Batch said, we're here for you, man. Hell yeah! So go uh, go fight this thing, kick its ass, man. Yes, sir. So, what do you got? I got. Uh, well, we'll be in Disney next week, everybody. So fuck yeah, bitch! Get ready for some great ass fun content, of course. Disney stuff. Fuck yeah, fuck yeah, fuck yeah. Gonna be fuck sick. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I just got the intro for the podcast about the hard times, brother. Oh, I did a thing. Oh shit! Oh fuck me! I, I already said what I said, but go ahead and say it. I did a thing. Kids. Tell them what you did. Your boy went and got his license, bitch. <laughs> What was that Ratchet noise? I, I, I was shooting you. the gun, dude. Oh. It went chick, chick, boom. Pew, 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 Mike pew, didn't probably take it pew, out, but pew, 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 pew. congratulations to the one and only. Me. Mr. Batch. Finally, Me. licensed Finally. electrician. Hell yeah, man. It's official, baby. Yeah, I can uh, come wire up your house incorrectly and burn it to the ground, so. I can only hope. Yeah, I mean, if you want to take that risk, go right ahead. Yeah, cost you a hundred bucks this, an hour, though. You fix it. Whoa, huh? fired. <laughs> <laughs> you're fired before you're hired. Jesus Christ. Find a cheaper one. 
I will. Me. I don't know what yeah, I'm good doing. Good luck. I'll just light I a candle. Help you. <laughs> I'm not gonna. Look good. All right, fine. Whatever. So, uh, why did you replace all our lights with candles? Oh, I'm the best electrician. That has nothing to do with electricity. I'm a fireman. <laughs> <laughs> Job security. <laughs> no, but seriously, dude, I know I've said it to you. Text, Facebook, Instagram, in person before the podcast started. I am very proud of you, dude. And I'm really excited Thank you. to, you know, see where you go from here. I knew you had it in you. Uh, yeah, I know man. it was a hell of a journey and I know there's still more to go, but dude, that you've got over a big bump here and uh, you mm. should celebrate, especially now, especially in Disney. We're, we're definitely going to celebrate, brother. For sure. Uh, I'm going to drink around the world, I think. I think I earned that. No, I didn't earn that. No, no, oh. no. Sorry, that was not. Well, last worthy. time I got engaged, I couldn't drink around the world. This time I got my license, I still can't drink around the world. But the no. fuck's a guy gonna do for a beer around here? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Make me want to strangle you sometime. <laughs> I'll buy you donuts. You can eat as many donuts as me. I don't Dude, think I, I could do that. I told my buddy who just got back from Disney at work, I was like, he sent me a picture of him eating the Joffrey's donuts. And I was like, oh, dude, I ate like three minimum of a day. He's like, no, you didn't. There's no fucking way. I yes, was like, he did. I'll give you my buddy's number and he'll yes, probably he yell did. at you about that. I ate more than that. So, yeah, it was more like four, sometimes yeah. five. Like it was disgusting. It's when we went to Disney same. Springs and you would have had oh. three. And then you went to that donut shop and I was like, there's no way. And you came <laughs> out with two. And I was like. Are you fucking kidding me? I was like, we're going to dinner in like an hour, man. And you were like, yeah, but we're like going to walk around. So I need something. That's and I true. Was like, not these aren't like normal donuts people either. These are like the size of your head. Like, <laughs> I know. And they got like Reese's cups in them and like oh, all yeah. sorts of fuck like fruity pebbles and shit. I'm like, are you kidding me, man? Like, Dude, I'll just never forget your fucking, I don't know which one it was. Yeah, it was Epcot and like. We were like walking and like, I was like, oh, hold on, hold on. I got to I got to get a coffee. And you're like, all right, all right. Like, because like you always stop. There's always something to grab. And I'm like in line to get a coffee. And then you guys are over at a bench or something. And then I walk over with a fucking donut. And you looked at me like my mother looked at me when I came home with my first tattoo. And you were like, no, are you fucking kidding me right now? And I just had the stupidest kid smirk on. And you were like, Steven, this, this, this no, I'm so upset with you. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, "Are you fucking kidding me, dude?" And then you, were, then you like looked at me like a little kid, and you're like, well, "I got it for both of us. We can split it." And I was yep. like, "You did not." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "There's no way." I uh, love it. Fuck, Fine. man. That's all I got, man. All right. Um. Yeah. So I did it. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. I uh, I cried real tears on the phone with my father. Um. He didn't cry. I cried. Mm. Like, because it was just like, I couldn't believe that I fucking did it. Mm -hmm. Like, such a crazy moment. Like, I worked so hard for that. And like, um, I missed the first one by one question the first time I took it. And I was like, fuck me. And then this time... I went in there and I was like, I got this bitch. And I knew when I looked up at the computer and I had to get 21 out of 30 questions correct. And I looked up at that computer and I looked up and it was 27 out of 30. Like I had answered 27 yeah. and it was only three left. And I knew all of them were right because I had them in the book. Yep. I was like, I started like tearing up in the thing. Hey. And I was like, I just hit. I hit end. That's how like confident I was. I didn't even answer the last three questions. I was oh, just shit. like, I'm done. Like, I'm done. I'm good. And the thing said pass. And I was like, holy fuck. I was like, I fucking did it. That's like, so fucking sick. I've done it. And then, uh, yeah, man, it's, uh, it's crazy. It's I never thought amazing. that like it would happen. Yeah. Like I'm a big boy now. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so <clears throat> anyway, I think I hear Bill knocking. Hey, Bill's knocking. But before yeah. we talk about Bill, I'm telling yeah, you about, hear the, about hard the hard times. times. If you don't know what the hard times is, the hard times is a very real punk news site that you should not question. Uh, just absurd the information as truth and move on. OK, just absorb it. And it's all true. Uh, the historic yep. satire site was founded 
in December 1976. It's made by a group of punk and hardcore kids from all different subgenres of the DIY hardcore scene. Any resemblance to actual persons or bands' names is just coincidental. <laughs> uh, this is straight from their website about their about me. It's a great pop, punk, punk, rock and roll, fucking hardcore, uh, sat- yeah, everything. The satire, fucking uh, amazing uh, Instagram, social media, all that stuff. Check out their website. But Bill Con- Conway, uh, the co-founder, editor in chief, who I got to meet, and he did the tattoo. Worst tattoo in Chicago at Riot Fest is where I got to meet him. You've heard about that in the past episodes. He is here knocking on the door, so we're going to let Bill Conway in and get to know about the hard times and a little bit about Bill himself. Hell yeah, kids. All right, we'll see you on the other side. Come yeah, on, Bill. Peace. All right. Oop, but there. That should do it. Hello? There it Hello? is. Hey, oh, there we so, go. Okay. Yeah, Zoom was defaulting. You know, these technology these days, it wants my <laughs> microphone uh to be the output you know like instead of the input because that makes a ton of sense uh, but, <laughs> but now we're in now we're in can can you hear me okay is the output or the input working is the mic working so or do i need to oh, talk yeah. to my headphones no no the mic's working beautiful hell yeah dude this is awesome dude it's good to see you man oh, it's, yeah. it's all mine thank you for having me Hell yeah. Well, we got yeah. fucking Bill from the hard times here. It was a pleasure to meet you at uh, Riot Fest. Pretty cool conversation we had together, finding out we're both South Shore kids. And, uh, you know, it was cool. Once once I found that out and checked out your whole spiel on Instagram, I was like, dude, got to have you on, man. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, no, it was great meeting you as well. And yeah, I mean, small world situation, uh, you know, when... You mentioned you're from, what is it, Pembroke? I was like, hold on a second. Correct. That doesn't even make sense. You know? I know. Because so. you grew up in what, Hanson? Yep, Hanson, yep. right right on uh, Route 58 across from the town hall. Yep. And Batch, nice. you're from what, Halifax originally? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, so. awesome. Everybody's from, uh, off of Route 58 then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right down the street, man. Hell yeah, man. Well, dude, well, first off, I know I've already said it six times since we started, but thanks again for coming on. Uh, we do uh as long as you want so you let us know when you gotta go no no uh no structure here as far as that so just let us know first and foremost and uh second off i want to start this off by just getting right into the hard times man because this is some interesting cool shit that i didn't even know existed until after following the hard times on instagram and you guys post some of the funniest memes i've ever seen oh my Um, god yeah so tell me, how did you get started with the hard times? Kind of give me the background on that, my friend. Yeah. So uh, back in 2014, um, so I was doing a podcast years and years ago uh, called Edgeland, where it was a podcast where I talked with straight edge people about being straight edge and formerly straight edge people about why they're not straight edge anymore. And uh, that was a good time. And I had a guy named Matt Sankum on the show. He was a frontman of a band Zero Progress, which was a Bay Area hardcore band. And he kind of had this uh, satirical character. It was like a professional wrestling gimmick that he was doing. And I found it funny uh, when I would see that pop up. Uh, so I asked him to be on the show. A couple months later, I saw him make a random post on Facebook that was just like, hey, I'm starting up like a onion style, um, you know, satire thing for punks and hardcore kids and i was i saw that post and i was like "Ooh, i'm in and uh so that night i wrote like i don't know like 50 headlines and him and i started talking things over and then him and i just kind of built it up from nothing for a little while and uh yeah it became bigger than we ever could have imagined it was just supposed to be a dumb hobby that goes away in three months you know one of those things uh but it got relatively popular, relatively fast, like just after a month of being around, like one of the singers of like, you know, one of the 75 singers of Black Flag was sharing one of our articles and we're like, oh, holy <laughs> crap, you know? So, um, yeah, it was just interesting to see how quickly it built up and that people related to it. I think, I mean, now there's there's a satire site for every single thing. Like if you're into knitting, there's like, a knitting satire page that you can go find but uh at that time there was not this uh big boom and it, i think it filled kind of a void and we were able to uh you know be be an onion ripoff that actually became something hell yeah hell yeah yeah, that's yeah i remember <laughs> i saw you guys you 
I think had made like a fake. It was like an interview with Zates, and it was like um, Punk spends Thanksgiving in his garage because he hates his family or something. He, yeah, that's one we'll repost every year around Thanksgiving, where it's like, uh, yeah, yep, Punk has annual tradition of avoiding his family in the garage. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, and it's just Eric standing in a garage looking <laughs> around. Uh, but we've had him in a couple of headlines. There was another one uh, that Eric had posed for, which was like um, hardcore kid begins his liking hockey phase or something like that. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And he's in that one as well, wearing his Bostonian barbershop, like hockey, uh, you know, gear. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, we just actually had Zates on what three nights ago or something. So that episode's gonna yeah. drop this Friday with Zates, which will be cool. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I mean him and him, you know, Eric and I will be at my brother's wedding in two weeks or whenever this airs is probably sooner than that. But uh, maybe it's already happened. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll be back in Massachusetts, uh, seeing seeing too much of that guy. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I know, like Batch and me. I batch knew Zates and then I knew him from batch and then through hockey. How did you guys click just from hometown South shore area? I mean, yeah, I, I, he grew up, um, three block, you know, I think he was off of Gorwin Ave in Hanson or, uh, whatever. And I was on Liberty street. So, but he's like my brother's best friend forever. And when the Hanson skate park first opened, you know, he would be there and I would be there and then, eventually as everybody grew up and you know i moved into the city or whatever then he would come into the city and hang out and then he got an apartment in the city and that became the hangout spot and you know it was just just a natural progression of uh just being around everybody but yeah back in the i don't know early teens late aughts uh there was a lot of wild times in in the city that uh, I'm sure he has plenty of stories. I don't know what he would have shared, but uh, <laughs> yeah, lots of interesting times were had. That's awesome, dude. That oh, skate yeah. park was my favorite place in the world, especially the mini half pipe that uh, half pipe they had. Oh I yeah, felt, yeah. Especially when I was younger, I felt like the most badass being able to shred that thing, and I'm surprised mm -hmm. that's still actually around. Yeah, I somebody sent me some. Well, it was actually my brother. He took his dog to it the other day and he was just running around with his dog. I was like, how is this place still around? I mean, it's been like 20, <laughs> I think 22 years it's been there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it opened when I was 16 and I'm 38 now. So yeah, it's been there. Uh, but yeah, that's those situate concrete parks, the biggest waste of money, uh, <laughs> biggest waste of taxpayer money that's ever happened. <laughs> and there's a special place in hell for the prefab <laughs> situate concrete people um, that, yeah, way to go. You ripped off a lot of municipalities and your <laughs> skate parks were the absolute worst. Um, so they can burn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh shit. This That's is so great. dope. Uh, so who comes up with 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 all the uh, these like memes and stuff? Like, is it everybody collabs together, or is it someone that like does specific ones? Because like, dude, these last few ones were not last few because you guys post so many, but those blink ones had me dead. Like, the man falls in love with a more affordable had a <laughs> with a girl more at a more affordable rock show and shit. Dude, these shits are like they're endlessly hilarious. Uh, yeah, we have a kind of an interesting. I mean, I I think it's an interesting process that we have, and it was kind of we when matt and i started we were doing it all ourselves you know it was mm -hmm. him and i and matt's brother ed kind of coming up with headlines and we would write them and then we would send them to each other to edit and then we would you know because we have full drafts so we have full articles connected to everything too i encourage anybody to read the articles they also have a lot more jokes that are good but mm -hmm. um the um quickly people were emailing us like, Hey, how do I get involved? Like, how can I write headlines for you? And which surprised us like, you want to do what now, you know, you want to help <laughs> us with, with what? Uh, and so we had a, we started like a Facebook group and we just had people like pitching headline ideas in there. And we kind of developed a system where everybody that's in the group, like we do it through Slack now and everybody that's in the group, um, uh, yeah, because uh, I'll tell the Facebook story in a bit why we don't use Facebook anymore, mm -hmm. but, uh, the uh, people in the group will pitch a headline. So random 
random guy in the group pitches the headline. And so all other people that are in the group can read that and be like, we think that is a funny headline and the editor should consider running this one. So they'll like, like it or whatever. And then we'll have our editorial meeting at the end of the week where we look at all of the headlines that have gotten a certain amount of likes and we'll kind of make our selection. We kind of whittle things down. So it's a somewhat democratic process of like the people that we find funny in the group uh, that are part of the creative process, like kind of signaling, this is a good headline. This is a good headline. And we'll look at those. And, uh, and then we assign those to the people that pitched them and they write the articles. We edit them. I make usually, I usually make a lot of the social graphics or we have a couple of the other editors make the social graphics and they go online. And uh, that's, that's kind of the process is it's moderately democratic. Everybody can be involved to, as much as they want to be. And we, uh, we have it that way and people can pitch whatever they want and people kind of learn like what works and what doesn't. Cause if you keep pitching the same joke about microwaving food in an office and it doesn't get any engagement, then you're like, well, maybe I need to stop pitching this sort of headline and go back to pitching about how Henry Rollins is a guy that can bench press or something like that. (laughs) Yeah, dude. (laughs) Hell yeah. But yeah. Uh, the Slack we, we've been doing it through Slack. We, we used to do it on Facebook, which is easy, but even in like a private Facebook group, if we like mentioned like screwdriver or some other, like, you know, like Nazis or screwdriver in a headline, making fun of them, Facebook was flagging us uh-huh. and being like, you're spreading hate speech and we're going to shut you down. It's like, no, 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 no. We're making fun of fun people of that like screwdriver. Uh, and yeah, so we had to get off of Facebook because their uh, moderation was, you know, they're, they're, they're reaching into uh, our private group and censoring us. I don't think so. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's funny that they, had a problem with you guys but not the onion i mean they might have a problem with the onion i, I don't know true. i don't know uh, anyone from the onion yeah so uh, <laughs> uh everybody i mean i mean i know the onion they have their own offices they probably don't have to uh do things on facebook you know part of the hard times is uh we've done it from our bedrooms the entire time so uh oh, that's so cool though yeah um yeah it, we've never had to uh waste money on an office because we would be like nah no nah, offices are for sellouts we'll just uh <laughs> we'll, we'll continue to do it from our bedrooms love That's it so dope so i was reading online about you because you're that popular um that you did stand-up comedy yeah i mean i'm kind of i, I did it for 10 years and like i still kind of do it but after the pandemic of my my motivation is way down, but yeah, I started doing stand up in like 2011, I think mm-hmm. at this point, uh, when I was living in San Francisco, which was a good place to do stand up. But yeah, stand up is a, uh, it's a, it's a tough business. Uh, that's a, a lot of public humiliation. If you're into public humiliation, then Ooh, baby, uh, <laughs> Get stand up on. Is for you, yeah, <laughs> you're just going to be rock hard all the time. Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, and, and, but I'm in LA now and uh, it's, there's plenty of stand up to be had around LA. I'm sure you can imagine, but it's like, mm. you know, you're going to the back of a bar on a Wednesday night and it's just like, uh, they're playing like a playoff baseball game. And it's like, Hey, uh, uh, open mic is going to start and we're going to turn these TVs off. And people are like, fuck you, you are. And I'm like, oh, all right, well, that's yeah, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll just uh, go tell our shitty dick jokes and uh <laughs> just try try to ignore us <laughs> fair enough uh, i think that's pretty cool man and like how do you feel like doing what you're doing now is your form of comedy now in its own presence you know oh yeah definitely uh i actually had this conversation there's a comedian jonah ray uh who does mystery science theater 3000 he did that like new version of it and he did stand up for quite some time and he kind of took a break from that and him and I were talking about how when you have that other creative outlet, if you're not like, if you are not completely in love with stand up, like it drives you, then it's easy for that to just kind of fade away. And that's how I kind of felt where it's like sometimes stand up was like, all right, it's not, I, it's not a, I don't get to go do stand up tonight. It was like a, ugh, I feel like I have to go do stand up tonight, you know? And like a once you're at, yeah. And once you're at that level, like, like you find excuses like, Oh, I'm not going out tonight. You know, it's, 
it's LA and it's like 68 degrees. It's freezing out. I'm not going to go out, yeah. in, you know, uh, <laughs> 68 degree weather. Um, but you know, there are plenty of my friends that are far more successful that still do stand up every night. Uh, and I'm just like, you are a maniac or you have some sort of, uh, deficiency elsewhere, but, um, good on you. But, uh, yeah, the hard times is definitely fulfilling that role of comedy outlet, uh, by leaps and bounds. That's awesome. I'm glad you're able to That's still really do good. something in that sense. Cause it feels, it sounds like, you know, I mean, you're dedicated a lot of time towards it. So if you can still put that passion towards it, that's really good, man. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's stand up is also one of those things like, you can, I mean, I could go to an open mic tonight if I wanted, you know, nothing's stopping me. You know? It's not going like, anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's always going to exist. So, and we'll see, I've been to a couple comedy shows lately and I kind of have felt the, the itch a little bit again. I, I was hosting a comedy show, <laughs> uh for a while which you know was like a monthly thing and i was getting up just but it like you can't do stand up once a month you have to yeah. do it over mm -hmm. and over if you're just doing it once a month you might as well not be doing it all at, at all i've heard that, that before. makes sense yeah uh, what part of la are you in man uh it's a little place called frog town which is uh adjacent to silver lake which is the neighborhood everybody makes fun of for like hipsters or whatever you want to <laughs> say um but frog town it's right by the la river but it, the la river is a much maligned river because it's just a concrete um yeah thing with a little bit of water running through the middle of it but uh i'm actually on like this really nice part of the river it's still just a big concrete ditch but it's like a bird sanctuary there's actually like vegetation in there and it's oh, really nice cool. but it's this neighborhood was a formerly redlined very working class like neighborhood that is quickly gentrifying because i think a lot of developers realize like wait this part of the river is actually really nice and so mm -hmm. now like condos are going up everywhere and uh this place that you know god once forgot is now um, a <laughs> high value real estate market um in in los angeles but it's it's a super quiet neighborhood and really really nice other than the occasional shooting but <laughs> So what, you know, hey, you're in L.A., yeah. man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, one guy gets shot. I'm not going to not going to get too concerned over that. Not a big deal. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> not for more batches. <laughs> no. Where, where, where are you? I'm in Lynn. OK, yeah. City of Sin, baby. There's, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I get it. A few people get shot here and there. Big deal. Yeah. yeah so, what? you know, yeah, grow up, you know, <laughs> you got shot. Grow up. That's nothing, Some, dude. Someone gets stabbed five times. Oh, well. <laughs> no. rub some dirt and it keep moving <laughs> yeah. now exactly. bill you are straight edge have you been straight edge your whole life yeah i have never touched a single thing i'm uh my brother and i both uh just never had any desire i, I I've, I've said it this way that there's like a spectrum you know most people are somewhere in the middle then there's the people you know that want to get fucked up on everything that are all the way over here. Then there's the people that just don't care about anything all the way over here. And I'm on this side of just like, I've never had any, I don't want to drink. I don't want to smoke. Never had any desire to never curious about it. So even if straight edge wasn't a word, I'd still just be like this. Uh, but it just so happens straight edge is a word and I can uh, buy into the straight edge meat, meathead mentality of it and then go full tilt and just be like, fuck you, uh, and all that stuff. So, um, but yeah, so yeah, I've been straight edge forever, but I, I found out about it when I was like 12 years old through my older cousin who was like straight edge for like two weeks. And I was mm -hmm. like, Oh, that's cool. But, uh, yeah, but yeah, so 26 years of claiming edge now. So nice, just, dude. just forever at this point. Edge for life. I nice like it, name. man. Now, what? Let me ask you, because everyone has their own definitions. What is your definition of edge, or is it just more of a feeling for you? Uh, I mean, to me, it's just uh, the outright refusal of anything that is uh, chemically altering. You know, okay. like uh, it. I, I th there's the weirdos that are like no sex before marriage or whatever, but that's some yeah. weird puritanical Christian bullshit that is just like that has nothing. <laughs> to do with anything you fucking weird loser um but <laughs> you know, somebody sent me well i saw a photo today somebody wearing a shirt that said like straight edge for jesus on the back of it and just like all right listen excuse me yeah like listen clown um 
the the dude changed water into wine. I've never heard of anything less straight edge in my fucking life. You know, right. you can't don't don't be like straight edge for Jesus, you weirdo. <laughs> uh, dude's blood was made out of wine. Uh, so yep, yeah. Uh, but yeah, for me, it's just I I, I do like the the extremist attitude of being straight edge too. I I, I enjoy that. You know, the mm-hmm. it is. Uh, you know, one of those things of most people at this point, you know, I'm in my thirties now. So everybody's usually just kind of cool. Like, Hey, you want to drink? Like, no, thank you. And like, that's cool. You know, yeah. but like back in your twenties, like when they're like, what is your problem, man? It's like, I don't have a fucking problem, man. <laughs> yeah. you know? like, Maybe you got the fucking problem. <laughs> <laughs> and those, those were fun times as well. But now oh, yeah. when you're an adult, people are just most people are like if they offer you a drink and you say no, then they just clock it in their head and be like, oh yeah, he's probably sober. You know, he's been through a lot. You know, uh, every time. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, and that's fine too. You know, uh, however you get there. But uh, yeah. So that, that's a basic. I like the extremist fuck you part of being straight edge. That's it's it's funny to me. It's what makes it enjoyable. I like that, man. Yeah, we were talking to uh, John James Ryan of Keep Flying. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were talking about like different styles of straight edge and how it's like completely like just from like the Ian Mackay days of minor threat and going back then and fucking to now and how it's completely changed. And there's all these like exactly like 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 you said, like not having sex for marriage and uh, coffee. And there's just all these different forms of it. Like everyone has their own form of it. So it's it's I'm curious to get everyone's take on it. Like myself, uh, I claimed straight edge when I was fucking I don't know, probably the same time, probably around like. 13 or 14 like i found out what it was through like bands like black flag minor threat and all that shit and i was just like oh this is kind of fucking sick like seven seconds oh shit that's Mm -hmm. dope like let's fucking go and like that's the music i was into and and then i just i got super fucking hardcore about it too to the point where i might have got a little too hardcore about it when i was younger maybe (laughs) i don't know it's tough not to when you're a teenager though it becomes your identity in a way it's uh because when you're in high school and you got the 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 dudes whose identity is just to smoke weed you know you're like oh yeah. please get out of here with that and then yeah like, but what but you're doing the same thing it's just on the opposite spectrum of being straight edge uh and yeah we've every straight edge person's been there we went a little too far yeah at some I, points, and but, that's yeah. you hit it on the head though i gotta say because that's literally like that's literally what i felt like like throughout middle school in the beginning of high school, I was like, well, these guys are such fucking idiots. Fuck them. They're so fucking stupid. All they do is smoke weed, blah, 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 blah. And then like, as I got older, I was like, wow, I'm being literally the same thing about something. I'm obsessing about something the same way as they are. And right. it's like, the fuck? And then the older I got, I was like, okay, this is uh, this is a little different. And it, mm. it completely changed who I was. And I mean, I got a tattoo on my leg, a straight edge brotherhood tattoo when I was like, I want to say like, 18 or 19 in my fucking cousin's um kitchen and i was like that was like for me that was like this is it like i'm not fucking changing but like i tried shit when i was younger because i wanted to see what it was i took like a couple sips of drinking and uh now just think- the interview over i can't be around you for yeah much there like it is we'll wait till i get <laughs> going yeah no <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, but no, man, it's interesting. It's 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 a cool scene, man. I've I met a lot of cool people at Straight Edge shows growing up. I met a lot of just cool people in general at all shows. But uh, it's cool to hear different perspectives and size. And I know it's a big part of who you are too. And uh, so I was, was thanks for that background, man. Okay. So I mean, you're you're thirty, right? Around Correct. there. Yeah, I'm yes. thirty. Yeah. So yeah. I feel like I mean the Boston hardcore that I came up with, like, you know, have hearts, the biggest band and like have straight heart, edge Boston yeah. and hardcore bands are like, you know, Boston straight edge was like the thing in like the early to mid two thousands. And I got to come up in that Boston straight edge scene where like, I mean, you couldn't swing a cat without hitting four, you know, straight edge people. Uh, yep. And then everybody, all of a sudden like, they break edge overnight. And uh, that's, that was, that was probably uh for me that was a weird time when all my straight edge friends became not straight edge anymore and it was so yeah. like upsetting at the time but now i'm just like oh, whatever man like there's some that have still gone too far like they're making up for lost time it's so, like oh yeah you're an extremist in either way like moderation just doesn't work for you and that's uh kind of just how it is like uh you're 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 just an alcoholic now. Uh, and before you were just an alcoholic that just didn't drink. Uh, so, mm. uh, mm. it's, it's, a. but yeah, when all of the, I think, I mean, 
Eric is still straight edge. My brother's still straight edge. But I think at one point, you know, if the, the crew of kids is 20 people deep that are straight edge, maybe four still are, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's like, oh, oh boy. But uh, yeah, it's uh, that that's always a weird time when all the friends start breaking edge. But when you're younger, it seems like the end of the world. And like, oh, I'll never talk to this person ever again. What a sellout. And you're like, mm-hmm. okay, that's that's the dumbest mentality you know, uh, oh, around. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, as long as, you know, they don't, your friend that broke edge doesn't become some sort of uh, drunk driving maniac, then who cares? You know, yeah. go with the flow. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Like to me, I know I don't look at Steve as not being straight edge because he uses CBD or might take some THC gummies to help him go to sleep at night. To me, he's still straight edge. Right. I mean, I never was, I was the opposite end of that spectrum. That's why I had to get sober and, that whole story is a long one, but like looking at him, I'm like, Oh, he's still straight edge. He doesn't drink. He doesn't like shoot heroin. Like, <laughs> you know, he's still, <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> so, and, and like seeing the way that they use now, uh, psilocybin for depression. Mm-hmm. Um, I would still let, like, I, I don't really have a saying who claims what, but like if you said, told me today, you, tomorrow you were still straight edge and you decided to take psilocybin for your depression, I would still be like, oh, cool. You're still straight edge, man. Right. Yeah. There's like a difference of like the person that is uh, constantly like, oh, yeah, well, I'm going on another vision quest out in the desert. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah. okay, well, yeah, you're, you're not and straight edge, but it's a person that's like, well, uh, I have two options. I can either take this thing that balances me out or I can have the gun in my mouth again. And mm-hmm. then uh, I can sit there and uh, just wait until the day comes uh, where this, where it, it all ends. But uh, yeah, it, it is interesting just to see um, what can balance people out and just get people back to like a baseline and mm. able to function, you know, uh, without, yeah complete anxiety or depression or, or whatever is challenging you. Mm. I think that's the biggest thing that I had to, I had to learn for myself was that it's okay to, you know, figure out something that's going to work for you because I got to a point where, you know, tried to take my own life a few times and my depression was just so bad. And I was just, uh, the doctor was prescribing me more medicine than I've ever could fucking think of and times were just tough and everyone goes through shit and i remember there was a point where i was like bro like i don't want these fucking 14 pills a day this is terrible this is shit Mm -hmm. what am i doing and i feel like i'm addicted to these because i was and then it was like okay like i'm not taking this shit anymore and and i i just cold turkeyed that which is fine and then like it was a point again where i was like all right i'm gonna try and take my own life and then it was after that uh, getting out of the hospital and shit and talking to some people and a therapist and stuff. I was like, you know what? I'm going to take some CBD and see if that helps me. And it really made a big difference for me. And then um, I took a couple of THC gummies at night when I felt like I was going to harm myself or something. And it was like, okay, this is, this helped me. And I, I will take this before bed if I feel like something's going that way. And it, And then it was just maturing through that and figuring out what was working for me and understanding that. And it's like, you know, now it's just like I take these CBD can of dips to help me just calm down at night and relax and just, you know, find that Zen in me. And I'd rather take that than 17 different medicines that are prescribed from the doctors. Not that there's anything wrong with that for some people, but I just for myself have found some peace at the time right now. And this is just what's working, dude. So it's like it's cool to see everybody find their own thing, man. If I didn't get to the point where I try to take my own life. I'd still be the old me, but the fact that I tried to do something so hurtful and harmful for myself is just like, you know, it was an eye opening experience of like things have to change or I'm like he said, that analogy of a gun. It's it's going to it's real. It's not mm-hmm. it's not a fucking stick with the phase anymore, bro. It's no fucking figure it out or you're dead. Right. So, but yeah, that's there is one thing, uh, you know, I, I think being straight edge is mainly a positive thing because I, I do think, uh, uh, you know not drinking, not smoking can always be beneficial. Um, mm-hmm. But also mm-hmm. the, the the downside of straight edge is when you make it such a part of who you are and your identity. And then you come to a time where you're like, I actually 
drinking a glass of wine with dinner actually seems kind of nice, you know, but you're in this own prison that you've made for yourself. Like, but no, I'm the anti-alcohol person mm-hmm. and I hate that. And I've seen so many people just struggle with that and become the angry straight edge guy. You know, it's almost that was like me. This, yeah. And it's almost the same as like the closeted, uh, you know, uh, homosexual person that is very homophobic. And you're just like, yeah. oh, if you could only be truthful to yourself, you would be a lot happier and you would stop harming the people around you and other people uh and yeah so if you're straight edge and don't want to be straight edge anymore you know to the extreme of you just you know whatever just do whatever you know, who cares about labels just do whatever the fuck you want That's you know? a it's, it's, but it uh, is yeah. real though and i'm glad you acknowledge that because like you know to harp on that that's important because that is something i went through man i remember literally you know, I, I talked to Batch about this. I cried to myself because I was like, dude, it's been my whole identity, my whole life. It's been like so much to me. And it was literally a point where it was like, dude, I just can't. I, I don't know what else to do. You know, I've tried so many things. And, you know, it was just like I, I talked to my therapist about it. I talked to a bunch of people, but it was it's a very hard mountain to climb and just and to finally be like, all right. And even like the moment I put it in my mouth, it was like a convulsive sweating. I did it. And then it's just like. Yeah, man, I just got to get over that, you know, and again, it goes back to what you said is like, you'll fuck the label like you're just a human being at the end of the day and do what you want to do, whether that's yeah. drink smoke or not. And and you just wrap yourself, man. <laughs> yeah. And I think we all have, you know, we're wrapped up in our own ego so much where we think like our one personal choice is going to affect everybody else to this like major levels like no nobody cares man you know <laughs> like, yeah, uh, you know, do what you want to do that makes you feel happy and then you'll it will be beneficial to everybody around you, you know? So don't, uh, and not everybody sitting around being like taking notes and being like, all right, well, we're having our weekly meeting talking about our friend again, uh, behind his back. Uh, Mm, so let's, uh, let's, uh, talk shit. You know, it's like, that's not happening. Everybody's wrapped up in their own shit and, uh, worrying about what's next for them. And, you know, so yeah, we all, we all have it where we think, you know, we're the star of our own show all the time. And that's just not the way it is in everybody else's eyes. So you can basically just do what you want and be a good person. And then things are better that way. Love it. For sure. Love it. Absolutely. Well, question for you. Yes. Getting off the edge topic a little bit here. Um, oh, I'll how- bring it right back to straight edge. Don't <laughs> worry. I love it, man. No, we can talk about it all day. Um, <laughs> How did you get involved with Riot Fest, man, and, and the Goose Island stuff and all that? Because I, I like I, I met you at that tattoo con worst tattoo contest. Um, and how did that whole thing start? And and like, yeah, just give me the background on that, man. Yeah. So, uh, so at Riot Fest for the past two years, the Hard Times has done a collaboration with goose island so back to the straight edge thing they are a brewery so you know feel like a sellout the entire time yeah. i'm there as they're like hey bill you want a beer like you know give me one of them waters over there that's all i need uh yeah but- you gave me a whole 24 pack and we're like buddy i got you <laughs> um but um so goose island is a brewery out in chicago and they are just they had known about the hard times for a while and wanted to figure out a way to collaborate at riot fest and they had the idea for a bad tattoo competition they did it last year pre-covid so whatever not last year but the one before that the last Mm -hmm. time riot fest actually happened uh and i i wasn't able to go to that one but this was the first year where we got to fly out and kind of do it in person uh get the whole premise was if you had a bad tattoo, they'll take a photo of it, put it up on the wall. Then we'll have some uh, celebrity judges basically pick the worst tattoo. I do think that the tattoo that got picked as the winner this year was not the worst tattoo. I think Mannequin Pussy made a giant mistake. Dude, uh, yeah. Can I just say the guy too. with the clown tattoo? Yeah, that was a pretty bad one. Or uh, mine. You know, the guy with the dick it. on his ass. Yeah, that, that guy. A, that was a <laughs> yeah. bad one. I mean, all right. So for the listeners, uh, there was a lot in the final round of maybe eight tattoos. There was a lot of bad tattoos. Uh, Steven's yours was one of them. It's a penis on your butt. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a terrible idea. It's a terrible tattoo all around. I yeah. mean, placement, uh, what it looks like. Uh, it's just, it's just not great. Uh, there was another guy that had a giant clown on his thing. It represented his ex-wife. It was kind of a cover-up. Trying to think of what else there. There was a cat 
with a dick for a nose on a guy's yeah. upper thigh, which was a very bad one that was a drawing that he that he did as a child. Like it was like, <laughs> what kind of like weird Whoa. childhood did you have where you were drawing multiple cat faces with penises <laughs> as noses? There was another guy that had it was supposed to be a tattoo of himself, but it was like of Bill Gates and mm-hmm. it had like money around it. And it was Bill Gates was like saying the guy's name. It was very weird and bizarre. But then the person that won, it was a photo, uh, a tattoo of a piece of steak, which was a well done piece of steak. Like not well done as like, that's how they wanted it prepared. You know, I'm not like, that's not, <laughs> it was actually like a decent steak tattoo next to a, a decent photo of Drake. Yeah. And it was Steak and Drake, which I mean, I, I almost was thinking like this, this tattoo is too well done technically to even be in the running. Yeah. Um, and here's what I think happened is that Mannequin Pussy is looking over all the tattoos and they see bad tattoo like your yours is an objectively bad tattoo, you know, yes. like uh, the cat knows uh, penis for nose objectively bad tattoo. They see seven or eight objectively bad tattoos and then they see one that's an outlier that's different Mm. and they're like well that's got to be the worst right you know like because these all so it was just like a one of these things is not like the other and uh so that person ended up winning the person that won the the year previous uh nobody will ever touch that tattoo (laughs) as far as how bad it was did you see the photo i saw it it was framed on the wall yeah it was it's a unicorn (laughs) like fucking another unicorn like puking a rainbow uh and it's just it's absolutely insane um the the person that got that tattoo is clearly uh on one but uh yeah that, that's like the high water mark but like if, if next year when they hopefully they do this again but next year when they put that tattoo next to like last year's winter steak and drake it's just not going to look right it's like look we almost stupid. have to we almost like to wipe it from the the thing but hey i wasn't the judge you know no, uh, no, you almost were <laughs> i was this close to being the judge you were, I they weren't uh, there <laughs> yeah and in uh it, I, th- I think uh next it, this was since this was the first year that i did it in person it's like okay we learned a lot of how this is actually going to work because this was like a dry run of like where are people going to be? What time do people show up to fests? When can bands, when are bands available to actually do this? And how can we make this a better experience? So we learned a lot. So hopefully we can do it again next year, fine tune it. Uh, because that's, I mean, much like stand up, you have to do it to see what works and what doesn't. And, uh, you know, processing everything that we did this year, it's like, okay, I'd say this worked at about 45% mm. of as good as it could be, but we can get this to 70% next year. And the year after that, we'll be at 90 and this will be like an event and this will be fun and people will want to like seek this out. But, uh, but it was still a good time regardless. And I think uh, everybody at Goose Island uh, enjoyed it. We got some, got to meet Guar and the descendants. Dude, know, the so descendants. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I got to say hi to them, dude. Yeah. I mean, it's it so just sick. insane. Yeah. Uh, it, it, that was the other thing about being at that fest was since I, I got to, get like a performer pass basically so i got yeah. to go like backstage so i met like brian baker from bad religion and minor threat and kevin seconds and it's just like oh my god you know That's like uh, this is uh, like pinch me i'm, I'm dreaming <laughs> yeah um, so yeah that, that was a good time got to see you know jimmy Eat world from the back of the stage and somebody was oh, like nice oh, it sounds like shit because they plug in directly to the speakers and we can't hear anything back here. It's like, yeah, you know, it's cool to stand back here, but boy, does it sound like shit back here. All you can hear is the drums. <laughs> yep, that'll do it. No, I, I thought it would, dude, I love the idea. I was walking by it and I was a bad tattoo and I read it and then the girl was like, oh, a bad tattoo. I was like, yeah, and then I showed her and then, I mean, the rest is history. You just explained it, but it was it was quite interesting to see. Someone else had in the top six or whatever it was, someone had a human centipede stick figure which I thought was fucking hilarious tattooed on their leg. Um, and then who else was there? Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember. I don't either. I wasn't there. No, you weren't. Bill, you there? I think we lost him. I think we lost Bill. Bill. Oh no. Let's talk. Oh, uh, no. Let's talk about Bill. Here he is. Microphone. Microphone. Can't hear him. 
Can't hear you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that awkward moment when. Yeah, I know. Just stare at him. Oh, there we go. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah, I don't know. His internet was just like, hey, no, I'm taking a break for a second. Um, <laughs> just needed to calm but, down. Yeah, so you were, I, I lost you right when you were saying you were walking past the booth and saw, you know, bad tattoo or something like that. Yeah, I just said I walked past the tattoo uh, boot, uh, thing and I was like, oh, that's cool. The girl came up to me, talked to her. The rest is history. You, you told the story. And then I was saying that, uh, there was also one in the top six or whatever it was that uh, had like a human centipede stick figure, which I thought was oh, yeah. terrible on this yeah. like pretty girl. But I was like, what the fuck is this doing on your calf? Like, yeah. you just go to the beach. She, she seemed like, I mean, that like too normal for like that right? tattoo. Like, uh, like, like, I, I don't even know how to describe it. She was just very like, I would picture her like going to church on Sundays you yes. know just like like a like kind of like a wholesome midwestern type of person is like wait you got stick figure human centipede and yep. she was telling the story about it that she thought of the idea while she was drunk one night waited an entire month and then got the tattoo completely stone cold sober so just uh bizarre but uh yeah it's terrible yeah, yeah. Yeah, hey. to each their own, I suppose. Hey, man, yeah. I got a dick on my ass, but I look like I have a dick on my ass, so it's all right. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, like, I, before you even showed me the tattoo, I was like, I already got this guy pegged. It's uh, yeah, it was... <laughs> it's a dick on his ass. Yeah. I know it. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, my, my reason to you is so fucking. I was because I like I'm not used to being on like a stage and you talking to me. Oh, well, I don't know. I just fucking wanted it. Uh, yeah, and you were like, uh, there's other ways you could have got other things on your ass or so. You said something that was fucking dying. Dude, I was like, this is great. <laughs> yeah i mean yeah so wait what what was the what's the real reason like i mean now that you're in a comfortable uh yeah. setting uh you know in your on your home turf that's right no i um honestly i don't have a reason i've always wanted a dick on my ass and that's what i said mm -hmm. in the interview but it was me and my roommate we were living in hull and we oh, the city of sin yeah <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we're sitting in his basement. We both had tattoo machines and we both have been tattooing for like two years, just like on our friends and pigskin and stuff. So whatever. And then it was one day I was like, bro, I want a dick on my ass. And he was like, bro, if I do yours, you do mine. And I was like, dude, and he was like, what? And then. <laughs> Yeah, we uh we we did so it. Wait, you have matching dates, like uh, well, on I did. Yeah, I did his. He did mine, and his, mine came oh out God. better than his, and mine's pretty bad. So, so you just press them again to, uh, together sometimes <laughs> to form like the mega dick unity, uh, you know, powers of two. Uh, That's it. Know. That's uh, the plan. Yeah, big moon landing with the penises there. <laughs> <laughs> um no that's literally the story and then we did it and i don't know why i did it and uh you know one day i'll get it covered up i already showed my tattoo artist in plymouth it and he already said he'd cover it up but that requires money and he'll just do whatever i don't it's be a it could be a fucking wolf's mouth i don't care what it is as long as i get it out of there so when you when you go to him in plymouth you know uh, home of the mayflower uh <laughs> you say do whatever you want and then he he just covers up the dick with a bigger dick tattoo that's like more well done like it's just like, oh man you know big i swear to god a triumphant fucker <laughs> <laughs> god i would i mean at least it would have looked better i don't know i don't know what's worse yeah. dude yeah i I, th I thank god every day when we were up in new hampshire mm -hmm. that and you brought your tattoo machine that i stayed just sober enough to be like <laughs> nope that's not a good idea <laughs> uh, yeah no you made the right call well because you tried I, yeah, everyone, like, come on, man, just let me let me it. do it. I wanted to tattoo everybody, dude. I got that thing when I was like 18 and I was ready to go. Yeah, I wonder if you guys, uh, so there was uh, year, years and years ago, I think the guy that ran the shop is dead now. And if you saw a photo of him, you'd be like, well, yeah, this guy was not long for the world. Uh, you know, his heart <laughs> was going to explode at some point. Oh, but there was a tattoo shop called Big Dogs, Inc. Uh, you guys ever heard of this in Massachusetts? No, I'm looking it up, though. All right. Uh, I have. It's, um, I think it's kind of scrubbed from the internet. Oh yeah, Chris Crinkle was the dude. Oh man, Chris, Chris Crinkle? Crinkle? Did he look like Santa Claus? It, yeah, he looked. He looked like a cracked out Santa Claus. Oh, oh. yeah. Oh yeah. Th these are just some uh, amazing tattoos. But Big Dogs <laughs> Inc. Their their um, tagline was like, 
uh, don't come up on the porch with the big dogs if you just want to piss with the puppies or something like that. And like, oh my they, god! But they had a portfolio <laughs> online. His portfolio online was presenting it as if like, hey, come and get, come to my shop and get tattooed. And they were wow, the these are terrible tattoos. Yeah, like just like Pat Patriot, and he just looks like a complete like oh cracked out Patriot. Logo. Someone sent me this link. I need to see this shit right now, dude. Uh, there's a there's a Confederate flag with an eagle ripping. It looks literally like a fucking a terrible is, chicken. I want to see this shit. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's some of the oh yeah i'm looking at the confederate flag one. Oh boy yeah yeah oh oh i see it i found it i found yeah. it on facebook yeah. right yeah there's a facebook i'm just That's looking I'm at looking some at. google images like some of these aren't his on google images but some of them definitely oh wow all that look like, at the patriots player he looks uh special yeah wow okay. yeah he looks like a mummy yes yeah i mean it's just like Jesus, if you were the tigers person, if you were the person that got these tattoos like i, mean, I did better sorry. tattoos in this guy yeah yeah, th- this is uh, the guy should not have been allowed <laughs> near a, a tattoo machine uh, ever. Uh, it's a crime. But well, that yeah. one's not bad. It's sad that people paid for this shit and it's on their body now. Yeah, but, well, they should come yeah. to Riot Fest. No, Chris Crinkle's no longer with us, unfortunately. Oh, so oh. um, R.I.P. Yeah, one, one of the greats. One of the greats. <laughs> uh, yeah, if anybody from the Crinkle family is listening, you know, my my condolences. Uh, oh, for you know, sure. We lost Chris, but uh, for sure. Oh, boy. Uh, he should maybe maybe tattooing. May, being an artist was not for him. Uh, no. but I'm sure, he could have been great at other things like, I don't know, uh, digging graves or something like that. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> oh my God. Just not a good tattooer. Uh, yeah, but yeah, for sure. But when I first started getting tattooed, uh, that's like, this was like the talk in the shops of like, <laughs> you know, like, can you believe this? You know, like, uh, just, just bizarre stuff. That I'm just going go through to. his Facebook and not one like or a comment on any of his pretty much tattoos. And there's a few and someone's just writing, really? LOL. <laughs> <laughs> this looks like something my six-year-old nephew colored in in a coloring book. Only Listen, he would man, do a better job. Wow. Your next tattoo. Might not Yikes. be so great now that you're speaking ill of the dead. I'm not speaking ill of the dead. Oh, you are. You're making fun I'm, of him. I'm, no, I'm speaking what's in celebrating. front of We're yeah. celebrating the life of Chris Crinkle and yeah. his work. Uh, that, that's all there is to it. Um, I, I just, I mean, I, so I, I've gotten plenty of tattoos in my life now. And I, I, I kind of like the, uh, the thought of like, there's one tattooer he does, he's like a part-time tattooer and just mainly like some weird art stuff now his name is max coon he's like a straight edge dude that's just like kind of out in the desert somewhere now but sometimes he'll like tour around and like you just have to book him and he'll tattoo you illegally in a hotel room but he kind of just does it, does it all freehand uh and that's like what i'm more into now is just like yeah, all right i trust you're good enough you know like and that this will come out looking good uh and but like that's more enjoyable of a tattoo than uh, to me than the stenciled out, completely thought out, you know, things. It's just like ah, tattoos are supposed to be raw and for degenerates. But the Chris Crinkle thing, it's a little bit too far. Like, OK, I'm not that much of a degenerate. Like I'm not like currently running a meth lab uh, in, you know, a deep Plimpton. So uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there's a name drop yeah i like that one that was good <laughs> hey what can i say anybody from plimpton hey plimpton speak up uh oh, actually cam's <laughs> from plimpton right yeah oh uh, he moved he he him and julie he transplanted there <laughs> he, Wait, he moved to plimpton like that was like a choice yeah 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 Jeez. Oh, all right well yeah, that's, that's i guess we love you cam <laughs> <laughs> uh no he used to live in taunton so it's much better okay yeah well yeah. that taunton of course <laughs> I remember one taunton. time he oh. told me he he got he got in his car at 6 a.m turned it on was putting the fucking heat on because it was cold and then he went to go reverse and look behind him and there was a homeless guy sleeping in the car oh wow he's like yeah <laughs> you can leave before i smash your face <laughs> sounds very taunton <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. As so, long as the guy was respectfully just sleeping there and not breaking a window, then you can't be too mad at that, you know? We're having uh, orgies, you know. <laughs> it happens. Uh, 
that in I, I used to live in San Francisco and apparently it's really bad ne- there now that uh people just yeah. break into cars like crazy to the point where all the broken glass on the street they just call it San Francisco snow now which I thought mm. is like a, a great name for that uh <laughs> makes sense uh, but yeah it's I, I, apparently very bad that if, if you leave like a matchbook on your car seat then somebody just breaks into your car and just like oh i'm taking whatever's in here dude i heard san francisco has an app now where you can locate homeless people taking shits on the streets oh i hope so i mean i'm into that <laughs> app it's like that's the one thing i'm into is like watching uh the most vulnerable members of society take giant dumps i heard just... that's all you see in san fran is just fucking shits on the sidewalk everywhere uh is that a myth when- uh, not necessarily. There's one part of town, the Tenderloin, where it definitely like at, at when I lived there, it was definitely a thing. Like, since San Francisco kind of had like such a progressive like homeless outreach thing that like Las Vegas would bus people in and just drop them off in San Francisco. So you just have like people that are just like fresh out of a hospital in a wheelchair, just dumped mm. on a corner and just like, well, you're here now. It's like, Jesus Christ, you know, like mm. what, what country do we live in? But um, yeah, there was plenty of times in San Francisco. I worked in a warehouse that was kind of down by women's play. And uh, I'm walking down to like the receiving area of the warehouse and I could see some rustling under a trailer across the street and I'm like what is that like what is going on over there and as I get closer it was uh two homeless men uh orally pleasuring each other and uh, uh under the truck and so that was when I would be like hey Jack come over here I gotta show you something and then be like oh yeah to, to take a look at that and he's like oh you motherfucker you know it's like uh, <laughs> but, you motherfucker yeah the, the amount of people I mean, so the shits on the sidewalk in San Francisco are one thing, but the amount of people I saw getting or giving oral sex just on the street in San Francisco doesn't happen in Massachusetts. Like, I mean, oral barely happens behind closed doors in Massachusetts. <laughs> you know, am I right? Uh, but in San Francisco, uh, there's this one time I'm skating home from uh, work and I can smell the very distinct smell of marijuana in the air. And it was right by like a a baseball field like a children's park so I'm like oh who's smoking weed at like the playground you know and I look up on these bleachers and there's a guy kind of standing there like his hands behind his head like smoking weed and another dude in front of him blowing the hell out of him like just crazy I was like wow that is <laughs> that's a blow job right there like, that guy's <laughs> that's a blow job getting it. Uh, uh, <laughs> but yeah just San Francisco, wild, wild. Jesus uh, Christ. But now, <laughs> Sounds like it, Jesus. Now all the tech people ruined it. There's no blowjobs anywhere in San Francisco anymore. It's fucking terrible. Twitter ruined San Francisco. You Twitter ruined blowjobs. Yeah, barely see a blowjob in that city anymore. <laughs> There's our headline, Twitter ruins blowjobs. <laughs> <laughs> so old people uh, shit on the streets now. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, oh, that's funny. It's, it's just... Uh, it's it's only people that make like less than seventy five thousand dollars, but more than fifty thousand dollars that are shitting on the sidewalks in uh, San Francisco at this point. It's like entry level programmers are shitting on sidewalks. I love it, love it. <laughs> All right, Bill. Now, what is going on with the hard times right now, and what is and if there is anything big and huge going to happen for the hard times or up and coming stuff that's going to happen that we're looking forward to festivals or things that you guys are doing too? Um, you know, so we're coming up on our eighth year anniversary of being a publication. So we'll probably, we weren't able to do our normal get together like we kind of do a little party in the bay area usually uh because that's where my co-founder matt lives is up in san francisco or he's in oakland um and so we'll probably do an eight eight year anniversary party the last time we did one we had to do it our our five year we did a big stand-up comedy showcase at gilman uh which was like the first time that stand-up ever really happened happened at the legendary punk venue so oh that's a little God. feather in my cap that i got to host a so comedy sick. showcase and kyle canane was so the cool uh so uh yeah that was cool so we kind of it's like we're never gonna top that one so we can just uh you know take it easy we'll just have a fun <laughs> time but a little know, barbecue you know, out back or something yeah you know that's we can just yeah but just chill out and we'll blow out the 10 year uh when that happens <laughs> uh and 
have a have a bigger stand-up showcase but um yeah there's nothing like crazy uh going on uh, it's just the the standard uh poking fun at the scene making sure that everybody is uh, accounted for that we're we're taking down uh, the meatball hardcore kids uh we're we're you know doing what we can to do accurate reporting um uh, everywhere across all scenes uh from from ska to beat down hardcore um and yeah, you know, so we'll see what happens uh, in the new year. Maybe we'll get some new podcasts going. It's been a while. My co-founder and I used to have a podcast and we're thinking about bringing back some sort of variation of it. It's just a matter of we're both very busy. And as you both know, podcasting can be a, you know, it's mm. tough to schedule things, you know, and it becomes a, oh, like yeah. a, a thing of working around schedules uh, a lot of times. That's literally what we were sure. just discussion, discussing before we hopped on was one of these bands and we had to like, they wanted something, we had to change things up and it's, it's all great. It's, this is all good stuff, but it's just like, oh, we got to switch this around and we got the PDF file. We got to look at the spreadsheet and then contacting emails, you know, the whole fucking deal. So mm -hmm. I, I totally get that it turns into a, a job, you know, and yeah, for sure. And hopefully one day me and Batch here will turn this into our job where we can pay mm. something from it and, you know, make a difference with with it that way. And, you know, maybe be part time at what we're doing now. So that would be fucking amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, I mean, that was my for the longest time. My goal with the hard times was like, oh, I just want to. Uh, all right. Let me pay my cell phone bill with hard times money. And then like that, that happens. Like, all right, let, let me pay my rent with hard times money. And now it's like. Well, the hard times is my full-time employment now you know yeah. it's like uh, and so now from that's like all right well uh shit I, i've uh put in the work and everything that i wanted has happened uh all right now what uh okay um let's uh all right let me let me buy uh you know multiple unit property and become a bastard landlord with my hard times money that's, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. i want to become uh yeah. just passive income and just be a slumlord <laughs> now can I ask you for some advice then? How did you manage to make it to the point where you could be, you know, doing what you're doing now? As far as us, we're small, man, and but we're we're trying to get to a point where it's like that. We want to get to a point where, you know, we make some money off of this and we can also donate yeah. a lot of money because we do a lot of donating. We do a lot of things on mental health because it's all about pop punk and mental health and, you know, spreading the word that it's okay not to be okay. And, you know, our, our, our goal is to be at festivals and have a tent and to have people have a place where they can talk and, you know, feel like they're okay. And, and, but also spread some music through pop punk and just the scene in general and, and, and give you news and breakdowns on bands. We just want to be able to like go to festivals and, 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 and just do our own shit like this. What, I just want to stop doing electrical work. Yeah. There's that oh, too. Like... All right. So wait, wait, I, I didn't really, I mean, this is, uh, all right, I'll answer your question, but first we got to talk electrical because I went to South Shore Vote Tech for electrical. Oh, I worked as an apprentice for a couple of years, you know, then I worked in supply houses for Were you 17 in the union? years. No, I wasn't in the union because I worked in supply. Like I, I, I worked for this guy, Thomas Cleary out of South Weymouth and hated it okay. so much. I was like, <laughs> oh, fuck this. And then I, I, I worked at uh, Ralph Pill for a while, which I think is Northeast now. Um, yep. And so, but I worked in warehouses uh, for, 17 18 years before the hard times started uh you know oh, Jesus. uh paying off uh so if the hard times wasn't around it'd still be i'd be in la and i'd be in some electrical warehouse somewhere in la around here uh who knows but um but oh yeah i mean are, are you a union guy where we talking yeah uh, all right so what was that what which local is that it's the uh 103 okay yeah the 103 baby um <laughs> but uh to answer your question going back i, I think the main the most important thing is consistency. If like you uh, have, say with a podcast, you got to be, you got to have it so people can rely on like, oh, Thursdays are my days. I listen to this, you know, mm -hmm. where it's just like, uh, if you're like, all right, well, I, we're late again this week or, hey, no podcast this month, uh, then people can't, um, they, they're not going to flow with it and, and keep coming back because it's such a crowded space that they're just going to, be uh part of the in the podcast economy of these major companies that are buying podcasts and can afford to just put people on salaries and then that becomes their job so you have to fight against this whole podcast economy uh that is mm. has popped up and so you just have to have the product that stands out uh can 
link up with a certain crowd like you know if you can really market towards the pop punk kids and really focus in on that and then build up the, the thing from there and start doing you know you get the uh, enough and maybe start doing live shows you start doing different tiers of you know maybe a patreon thing you know it's all just building slowly but the number one thing is consistency and that's like with the hard times like we've never missed a day where we didn't post something like maybe there was like one day where we intentionally didn't post something about it's like because there was a reason behind it I forget what the reason was but at the time it was like hey we're not going to post on this day um, but it's always been like no matter what like we're going to be consistent and we're going to put something out and uh, so I think that is always in any creative uh, pursuit consistency is the most important thing awesome yeah, yeah thank, thank you for you. that yeah, we we at Fridays are drop days. I we usually don't ever miss a day unless there's like what we've had in the past is pretty much deaths are the biggest thing um, that have stopped us and like, you know, stuff like that. But we we're pretty consistent and batch runs the social media for the I'd say 95 percent. He does the social media. I do the editing and we have a good thing going and he every day batch usually posts something. But you know, that's something that, you know, it's just the grind and we'll keep doing it. And then we get all we get as many bands and people that we come on, whether it's, you know, you know, bands like A Lost for Words, people like you and Zates and, you know, um, Goalkeeper, just a bunch of bands. And we just try and be the biggest thing is just having fun. But taking it to that next level is something that we're looking forward to doing. And, you know, it's it's always good to get that advice. So I appreciate it, man. Yeah. And with the the way the podcast world is changing well even social media algorithms are changing i mean cut one minute out of the show make it a reel make it a tiktok you put yeah. that up you know and you mm -hmm. got you got content it pushes people to listen to the whole episode and you can feed it that way like when i was doing podcast in the early teens like instagram was just becoming a thing so it's putting up like one slide of a photo but now it'd be like if i was doing that i'd have to i'd be putting up a minute clip of something you know uh, yeah. so it's all just it takes time. It, it, it can be a grind, but uh, if you can f peel off five listeners from one TikTok post that keep coming back, then they sure. tell one person and you might get 25, uh, you know, and all of a sudden you see your, your downloads doubling. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's just figuring out where, where the people are at and meeting them there, you know, and that's, uh, that's always the difficult part is because the algorithms change and, uh, there's going to be a new addition, like, you know, Instagram will put some new feature that everybody hates, but if you just are like, well, we're going to try that for a bit. And it's just like, well, Instagram wants everybody to try that. So they put you in a bunch of feeds and you're like, all of a sudden, Ooh, baby, a little popping mm -hmm. off. So, uh, you, you never know what's going to work. Good shit. Right. Good shit. Hell yeah. Batch, you got any questions or anything <clears throat> else? Yeah. Um, like what was your moment when you were like holy shit we like like i made it like holy fuck uh th th that, that moment never never happens it, it's a weird thing um there, there's always you have to have an appreciation like yeah of like I, I can look at social media numbers and whatever and be like oh this is crazy like i, I can't believe this little project has you know nearly seven hundred thousand followers on instagram or, or whatever and but day to day I'm editing drafts or I'm trying to create some social posts. And it's like, I'm just working on Photoshop and I'm like, Oh God, you know, here we go. I got a <laughs> fucking dug. And I'm like, wait a second. I, I, I'm lucky enough to get to do this as opposed to uh, loading up some, some, uh, you know, uh, some 12, two MC. From... Yeah. I'm not, I'm not slinging any 12, two or any, I don't even get me started on 10, three. I mean, if you want to get oh, your shoulders God. fucking jacked up, you know, throw a roll of huh. 10, three into the back of a pickup, you know, <laughs> uh, and I'm not, Jeez. I'm not on a ladder with my hilti drill, uh, you know, trying to fucking go through a concrete wall or anything like that. Oh, um, boy. Music so... to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, is there's always in even like you know somebody you know emails me be like hey i love the hard times like, you do <laughs> well that's amazing you know like thank you for that uh because you know it it's it, you, you never really know you, you put something out there and you just hope it takes off so you know and then people will be like oh yeah well bill you you've got to figure it out it's like oh i i guess you know like thank you mm. for that but you know it's always like well let's 
I've achieved this goal. Let's, let's move on to the next one. Because if you just say like, all right, well, yeah, if I stopped it, I want to pay my rent with the hard times. And then I would have stopped at, I'm going to pay my rent with the hard times, you know, and I yeah. never went further than that. But now it's just like, all right, well now the hard times is my livelihood, but what's the next thing beyond that, you know, a Ferrari. Yeah, Lamborghini. yeah. I want, I want the hard times Ducati, you know, just hard times Ducati. <laughs> blasting around LA, uh, me going in reverse 85 miles per hour down Rodeo drive, uh, you know, yeah. just living the LA dream. <laughs> That's what I'm looking forward to. I want to basically, I want to be able to get away with vehicular homicide. Uh, that's it. I just want to get off on all charges. Uh, that's the next goal is to get wealthy enough where I can take down a pedestrian who was legally crossing the street and I will get off on all charges. That's it. That's hell. That, I'm with you. That's yeah. where I want us to go. <laughs> that's it. That's the it's ultimate a, goal. It's a modest no press dream. Is bad press. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's so. Yeah, it, it's always just uh, you, you keep working towards it, but you appreciate the milestones along the way because you can't get jaded or bitter or else you start to resent what you're doing and mm. then you lose the thread and people notice, you know, if you're like mm. you're phoning it in, then people are just going to be like, oh, fuck this. You know, if every Hard Times headline was just a recycled, like, you know, thing like, didn't you guys do this like two months ago? And now you're doing mm. like this, basically the same exact headlines? Like, oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, whoops. Uh, <laughs> sorry. You know, yep. so uh, yeah. Yeah. You guys have been killing it with the, um, the blink headlines, the one with the Kardashians. Oh, yeah. I was Def- fucking rolling. Definitely enjoyed that one. I mean, when Blink 182 serves you up such easy material, <laughs> like charging $750 for general admission tickets, I mean, you, you, you can't just. You can't just let that slide. You gotta, you gotta say something. Mm-hmm. What was, what was the Green Day one I saw mm, the other day? Uh, shocking elder abuse. Uh, these teens are making fun of my Green Day shirt. That one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's at the mall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was good. Cause it's funny. Cause Steve's a diehard Blink fan, and I'm a diehard Green Day fan. So when you mentioned nine twenty four Gilman, I was like, oh my god, like that's like mecca to me yeah have have you ever been to a show there no i want that's what i'm secretly trying to push the honeymoon to go to california so we can oh look at that there's 924 gilman wow let's just say hi here it is here here it is i mean this is easy honeymoon is in napa wine country so berkeley's only like an hour away from that you know so you'd have to fly into sfo to do it um sfo is uh i don't know 30 minute drive from Gilman. Uh, mm. So it's e- easy money. You know, like, you know, just book the honeymoon. You see that some band is playing Gilman that you want to see. And then it's just like, oh, well, we're staying two nights in San Francisco anyway. We might as well take the BART over to, uh, you know, Berkeley and check out the show. That's <laughs> just wrap it up. It's easy. Napa, wine countries, <laughs> the honeymoon. Oh, yeah. A couple extra days in the Bay Area. No problem. That's it. They got you covered. Um, <laughs> Love it. Steve, edit that out so she doesn't hear yeah, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, fucking awesome. So, so have you met the guys from Blink and Green Day? Or no, um, Tom like, DeLong follows the Hard Times, and, Ma- and Mike Durnt follows the Hard Times, and I think Trey also might follow the Hard Times. Dang. But um, a friend of a stand-up comedian friend of mine, Amy Miller, her brother was in the band Sam I Am, and. Mm. He is owns a bar with Billy Joe in Oakland. Uh, and there was a time where like before COVID, where we were briefly discussing doing like a hard times comedy show at that venue where Billy Joe's like secret side project band with this guy from Sam I Am would be the house band, but it never came to fruition. It was like too many moving parts and it was just kind of a half-hearted, yeah. like we should do this, but it was just like yes, we should, you know, like, uh, that's, that sounds like a great yeah, yeah. idea to me, but, uh, never happened. And, uh, we'll see, but, um, yeah, I've never, never gotten to meet either of them. Um, but Mike Durnt seems to, even though we do poke fun at a lot of green day, he seems to have a good sense of humor about it. And, uh, we'll yeah, usually I mean, like those posts. That's so sick. That's so cool. Like, oh man. Yeah. I mean, that, that's one of those things of like where it's crazy, uh, meeting people in the bands that I really like or seeing like 
Jim from Jimmy Eat World is a hard time. Yeah. Fan. Like he reposted, like we did a, hard, a Jimmy Eat World joke and he like shared it in his stories saying like, I feel like I've made it now that the hard times has like made fun of us. And she's like, no, that's not how this so works. No, Jim. no, we made it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't think you get this, Jim. Uh, that's, um, and, you know, there's the guitar player of Minus the Bear. Um, I, he played in this band Botch, which was like a early 2000s uh, math core band from Seattle. And they one of my all time favorite bands, but he's been a supporter of the hard times for the past few years. I've gotten to talk to him, which is like literally like a, like somebody pinch me. Cause I used to listen to minus the bear, like on my Walkman all the time. Like as I commute around, like I'm on the commuter rail going to and from Boston and just only listening to like his guitar riffs. And, uh, but now like I'm, I'm talking to him through DMS and just like, uh, what you know like hold on a second like is it, but you're the guy uh um, oh, yeah. so yeah like th- those those moments are cool and i try i don't ever want to get jaded you know from like oh who, right who, who go with the bass player of this band i don't give a fucking yeah. shit you know it's like oh, no uh, <laughs> it, this is always this is this is interesting and cool and uh i i want to appreciate it and just be able to say like hell yeah all right cool and we got a thing that people like uh and i enjoy that yeah that's like we had that moment when we had maddie on from a loss for words Mm -hmm. like before he came on me and steve were like holy fuck like it's like michael from the office it's happening yeah Yeah. uh so the the first time i ever met maddie um he he will not remember the story because this is a benign story probably not going to go anywhere but i remember i think a loss for words might have been a band at this point but uh, we're at uh we're in Hanson uh it's a house party so, you know we're teenagers uh and he comes in and he's like he wants to put on a cd because uh, I was by the cd player I was kind of being the de facto dj putting whatever it was, it was like a five disc changer um and he was like oh I want to can we play this band under oath or something like that and I was like and he handed me the CD and I was like, I swear to God, man, if this is a Spin Doctors album, I'm going to lose it. Because I already knew there was a Spin Doctors <laughs> album in the five disc changer. So I just mm-hmm. switched it over and started playing the Spin Doctors. Like, you motherfucker, you tricked me into playing the Spin Doctors at this party. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. It's under oath. And I was like, this is clearly the Spin Doctors. And the, <laughs> the bit didn't really go anywhere, but I thought it was funny at the time. <laughs> but he was just like legitimately confused of like, no, I handed you an under oath CD. I, I know I did. Um <laughs> But yeah, that was uh, my first time uh, meeting Maddie way back in the day. I think it was at Mark Bonchek's house. What's up, Mark, if you're out there? Uh, <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, but, yeah, I love those moments, man. I mean, we've had a lot of those moments, you know, not oh, to yeah. the tier that I know we will get to at some point, but even like Anthony from Capstan was fucking, that was fucking really sick. And talking to uh, Jarrett from Bowling from Soup not on the podcast yet, but just through DMs trying to make something happen and all the other bands, man, it's just a pleasure. And it's a great community of like people, you know, and it's, it's super, it is super surreal. Cause like me and batch before this, we just love the music. We love the scene. And then all of a sudden now it's like, you know, we made something out of us and now we're a part of it even more than just listening to it. We can actually like feel like we're involved with it even deeper than just like relating to the lyrics it's it's yeah. it's awesome like we're going backstage in the green room and hanging with bands now like that's like mm-hmm. so fucking cool dude and i don't know it's fucking awesome dude and they're just human beings they're just people but it's still yeah. so surreal and when you do a podcast everybody likes to talk about themselves you know so it's easy to get people to that's say right. hey, you want you want to come uh on our show you just talk about uh how great you talk are. about your band yeah. and yeah. how awesome it is and yeah. Yeah, it's easy. I mean, that's that's why I came on. I just want to talk about how great I am. So uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, not hard. Yeah, it's. I mean, I mean, when you're this good looking, this tall, uh, you know, <laughs> perfectly symmetrical face. Appeal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. It's. Uh, you know, you you want to see yourself on a Zoom where you realize your nose is way more crooked than it actually <laughs> is. Like, uh, it's just. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's good shit love it hell yeah man so how um are you still like super into music because i know when we were talking to zay it's it's because he's doing all the festivals and shit with uh idle hand and everything like that he's like i kind of get burnt out with like 
music, like new music and stuff. Are you still like finding new bands and? Yeah, it's funny. Like when I find a new band and I, I look them up and I'm like, oh, they broke up in 2009. And I'm like, just fig- finding them like now. It's just like, how did I miss oh. these guys? You know, like. Uh... 20 years too late. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, there's still the discovery aspect, which I like. It's just, it's a much different now where it's like if I do go to a show I'm kind of like all right what time does the headliner go on uh you know where it used to be like I need to get there 30 minutes before doors you know so right uh, but I mean shows are different it's not no longer going to the Kingston Knights of Columbus where it's your friend's band plus 35 others yep. you know it's just like okay I'm going to a rock club and uh you know it's it's a band that I want to see, but they're playing with two bands that they like. But it turns out the music they like is not the music I like. Yes. Uh, so um, mm-hmm. uh, I don't actually care to see these bands. Um, yeah, it's no it's no longer like a, a hardcore show of you know, all these bands sound almost identical, and I yep. love them all. It's uh, like all right, they're kind of like a stoner band, but they're all uh, you know. Uh, Harry Krishna and they're gonna like <laughs> do a lot of chanting like no I'm, I'm good you know I don't need to see that let's I think we'll show up 15 minutes before the headliner is supposed to go on that's that's how we felt when uh we saw movements was on tour with knocked loose mm-hmm. and I was like and Kublai Khan and Koyo and we were like one of these things is not like the other <laughs> like <laughs> And we we like movements. We love knocked loose and everything else. But it was like seeing that together would just be like one minute you're ready to rip the door off the hinges, the next minute you're apologizing and putting it back together. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm really sorry for this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You can't uh, go from pink cloud to fucking uh, counting worms. <laughs> yeah, that those mixed bill shows like that. I mean back in the day when it's like the local acts where it's just like, okay, the ska band is playing with the the hardcore band. Uh, and there's also six pop punk bands that are all on here. It's like, yeah, this is fine. Cause it's in a basement. But then when you're going to a show like that and you just see like the uh, dude, that's clearly there just to fuck people up. And you're like, mm-hmm. ah, all right, well, he's just hanging out for the, the next 45 minutes. It looks like he's getting bored and frustrated. We're about to pay for it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, as soon as oh, his knock yeah. loose starts, uh, somebody's why is getting he wearing a, uh, Why is he wearing a mouth guard? <laughs> we saw we saw a guy, no lie. We saw a dude at Middle East um, at the No Prussia show. And he had no lie, like full on like skateboard knee pads and elbow pads. Hell yeah. Mm-hmm. This Hell dude yeah. was ready. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe uh, let's 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 think this through. He had just been skating vert. You know, and yeah. just, he just saw went straight no from the vert ramp. <laughs> yeah, went straight from his vert ramp. Didn't realize because he's so comfortable in his pads. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, this this will have to be uh, the the last story I have. But uh, so um, back, I mean, I I'll, I'll talk as I'm the elder statesman here. But back when Newfound Glory was newfound glory would play with a lot of hardcore bands because they have like you know the heavy breakdown parts they just have the the whiny singing over it which i do enjoy but they were the band that was an excuse for hardcore kids to go beat up like non-hardcore kids that were just there for like <laughs> pop punk you know so it's just like you could be the the big tough dude that only listens to uh you know sheer terror or whatever beat down hardcore band you want to listen you're you're big into death before dishonor but you know what you also want to just go see newfound glory mm. and um there was one time in san francisco this one guy he had gloves that i think were some sort of construction gloves but they had the plastic bubbles on each knuckle so they were like oh yeah oh, he's, he's you know, there to fuck some shit up yeah and so he would be like moshing and kind of like crowd killing at people and in like I I have no like tolerance for that. Like I just like okay, I don't usually like to fight people, but um, don't come fucking near me. You know, like the, <laughs> yeah. with, with that bullshit. And uh, you know, I, but I would probably just get 
beat up by him and his friends because uh you know that's just the way it is i'm not the biggest guy in the world so it'd be easy for him and his dumb gloves to beat the shit out of me but uh yeah like that that dumb shit was always uh interesting to me at newfound glory shows i don't think that happens anymore i think all newfound glory fans are too old to move around at this point so everybody <laughs> sits there nods their head and be like oh i hope this is a seated venue that would be great if <laughs> yeah seated. Dude. that's half the time <laughs> What do you mean standing room only? <laughs> do you know how bad Bring my knees are? There at this point. Yeah, right. <laughs> Jesus. Awesome. Um, you got anything else from Steve? Or... No, I just do our, uh, do our, uh, my question I always ask, and uh, mm-hmm. we'll let Bill go on his way for the rest of his day. Sound good? Mm-hmm. Sweet. Yeah. All right, Bill. Um, so. We are a pop punk podcast, but we're also a mental health podcast. And we did talk a little bit about mental health. And I always like to end the show asking our guests if they will, that would be great. If not, totally okay as well. We like to ask, you know, what are some tools that maybe you use, like reading, uh, going on a walk, uh, making a meme, doing comedy, stand up, whatever it may be to help with, you know, maybe some mental health issues that you deal with. And, you know, Uh, Things that we can, you know, provide people with uh, as far as like something that can help them with their day. Like for me, uh, you know, playing hockey, working out, listening to music, doing this podcast. Those are things that can help with my depression and anxiety. Uh, What are some things that you can kind of relate to people and help them, you know, help them out with? All right. I'll have to keep this brief because I realized so this uh, plugging in this uh, microphone also drains my battery. So I'm I'm running low. But all right, bro. For for me, it is a. having I, I like having a routine so i'm up early i walk my dog i take him on a nice walk in the morning then i do some uh, like a little light workout at home then i can you know eat a good breakfast and i start my work i like having a routine where i can just kind of check boxes off like that what helps with compartmentalization of like the things i need to do during my day like if things are scattered and i'm all over the place it builds anxiety and i'm like oh shit like how do i get this done what what am i going to do i don't have time to get this done but having a routine that I like to follow, like even even like this can of water, like this liquid death, like I have one of these with my lunch. I, this is when I have like, otherwise I'm just having water out of the tap or whatever, but like, all right, so I crack this open. I know it's lunchtime, you know, and I sit yeah. here and I can just have that 45 minutes of, I'm just gonna watch whatever dumb show I am watching on Hulu right now. And I'm not gonna think about the hard times for 45 minutes, you know? So routine is big for me. Love it, brother. Oh, oh, yeah, man. Thank Love you it. very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. Oh, thank you, guys. All right, brother. Well, we'll let really you go. I appreciate and it. I hope you have an amazing uh, weekend, and uh, we'll be talking soon. All right. His computer must have died. Yeah, it's all right. He said bye. I saw him wave. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. We're was, good. Yeah. We're so, fine. <laughs> thanks thanks to bill that was awesome that was awesome dude that man. was a blast that was cool man it was so fun to <laughs> to talk and dude he's he's fucking funny man you can see the comedian yeah, in him. he is you can yeah you definitely yeah. can for sure so, so definitely check out the hard times people yeah if you haven't already yeah i know uh right? you know hard times is cool yeah, one of my favorites I was just looking at was like, help, I tried singing like Blink-182, and now my voice is stuck this way. <laughs> <laughs> so good, dude. Oh, so they're fucking good. awesome. Yeah, so Bill from Hard Times News, check them out, Instagram, all that good stuff. They got a link tree and all that. So um, what else we got before we go? We got to talk about a local band that we are going to play their song at the end of this. Uh, called Waiver Wire. Ooh, yeah. Do you want to hear about Waiver Wire? Yeah. What's uh, what's going on? Who who is that? What do we what do we what do we need to know? Waiver Wire is a four piece pop punk pop punk band from Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, first formed in 2018, nearly got knocked out by the pandemic, and reformed last year with a semi new lineup. Since then, we've been gigging anywhere and everywhere we can, building chemistry within the new unit and writing new material. Uh, they have a new EP coming out called Wasted Wasted Time Well Spent uh, is the culmination of that. And we think it represents a great leap forward for the band. 
uh, the song that they have chosen to show the perfect representation of where they are is TikTok, Everything I Could Have Been. Hell yeah, so, brother. Hell yeah. We're going to play some lo local lads here for you. So that's all I got. Um, don't know if you have anything that you want to end with. No, no, we can go out with uh with everything I could have been. TikTok. By... Oh yeah, TikTok. Go, yeah, yeah, we'll go out by that. All right. Yeah, so that's about it. All right, everybody. Uh this is Waiver Wire with TikTok, everything I could have been. Check them out. Yes, it seems I'm colorblind. Cross double yellow lines. They're only there for show. Hit the deck look out below. And now I'm trying to Erase my clustered mind Please forgive me if I sound a bit unkind I let myself to rust Turn my back in disguise Everything I am is only everything I could have been It swells like peeling paint in cheap motels Painful things you can't avoid Crowding out what you enjoy A sweep of the waiting game While everything just stays the same Can't believe what we became Not a goddamn thing has changed I sound a bit unkind I let myself to rust Turn my back in disguise Everything I am is only everything I could have been Everything